we're going to talk about building functions from functions. Knowing how a function is put together is an important first step when applying the tools of calculus. Functions have their own algebra based on the same operations we apply to real numbers, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. One way to build new functions is to apply these operations using the following definitions. Now, we can add functions, subtract, multiply, and divide. Now, for adding functions, f of x plus g of x will just be f plus g of x. f minus g will be f of x minus g of x. f times g will be f of x times g of x. And f divided by g will be f of x divided by g of, g of x, granted that g of x can't equal zero. Now, in each case, the domain of the new function contains, consists of all the numbers that belong to both the domain of f and the domain of g. As noted, the zeros of the denominator are excluded from the domain of the quotient. Now, Euler's function notation works so well in the above definitions that it's almost obscured what's really going on. The plus in the expression f plus g of x stands for a brand new operation called function addition. It builds a new function f plus g from the given functions f and g. Like any function, f plus g is defined by what it does. It takes the domain value of x and returns the range value x, excuse me, f of x plus g of x. Note that the plus sign in f of x plus g of x does stand for the familiar operation of real number addition. So with the same symbol taking on different roles on either side of the equal sign, there's more to the above definition than first meets the eye. Fortunately, these definitions are pretty easy to apply. Now remember, when we're adding these, we're taking f of x plus g of x, we're adding our y values. If we're subtracting the functions, we're subtracting our y values. Same idea. Now in example one, we need to find formulas for f plus g, f minus g, and f times g, given the domain of each. So if we look at a, f plus g of x will be x squared plus the square root of x plus 1. Now our domain, there's no restrictions on x squared. There is a restriction on x plus 1. Now remember, x plus 1 has to be greater than 0, greater than or equal to 0. So that means x cannot equal, or can, it has to be greater than or equal to negative 1 which means my domain will be zero, uh, negative 1 to infinity. Now that minus g of x will be x squared minus square root of x plus 1. Again, your domain will be negative 1 to infinity. Now f times g of x will be x squared times square root of x plus 1. Again, your domain will be negative 1 to infinity. Looking at b, a little bit different, just because they're different functions, but it shouldn't be too bad. f plus g of x will be the square root of x plus sine of x. Now you should know that the domain of sine of x is negative infinity to infinity. For x, because it has to be less than or equal, or it has to be greater than or equal, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. Therefore, my domain will be zero to infinity, including zero. F minus g will be square root of x minus the sine of x which your domain, again, be 0 to infinity. For f times g of x, that will be square root of x times the sine of x. Domain will be the same exact thing, 0 to infinity. Now since we've added, subtracted, and multiplied functions, now it's time to compose two functions together. Now, it's not hard to see that the function sine of x squared is built from the basic function of sine of x and x squared. But the functions are not put together by addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. 
Instead, the two functions are combined by simply applying them in order, first the squaring function, then the sine function. This operation for combining functions, which has no counterpart in the algebra of real numbers, is called function composition. Now, let f and g be two functions such that the domain of f intersects the range of g. The composition f of g, denoted f o g, is defined by the rule f of g of x or f of g of x. The domain of f of g consists of all x values in the domain of g that map to the g of x values in the domain of f. Now you can really see this mapping here in the diagram. Now x is going to go into g of x, and g of x, you're going to put the value of g of x into f of x. It'll be a lot easier to see uh, once we get into example two. Now the composition g of f denoted g o f is defined similarly. In most cases, g of f and f of g are different functions. In the language of algebra, function composition is not commutative. And you'll see that as we move on. Now in example two, we need to find f of g of x and g of f of x. So f of g of x will go like this. Now g of x says it's a square of x. So really what we're doing, we're going to find f of the square of x, which means then we're going to put e to the square root of x. Really all we're doing, we're switching out our x value for square root of x. Now our domain will be 0 to infinity, including 0, because you cannot take the square of a negative number, because that's the domain of g of x also. Now if we find g of f of x, that will be g of e to the x, which means we'll have the square root of e to the x. Now, because the domain of e to the x is negative infinity to infinity, our domain here will be negative infinity to infinity. Again, we're finding the domain of the function that we put into the other function. Now, for part b, f of g of x will equal f of x minus 1. Now, putting that in, we'll have 3 times x minus 1 plus 2. Simplifying that, we'll have 3x minus 3 plus 2 will be 3x minus 1. Now, my domain here will be negative infinity to infinity, again, because it's a line. And it's a normal line, the domain is negative infinity to infinity. Now for g of f of x, very, very similar. So we're finding g of 3x plus 2, which means we'll have 3x plus 2 minus 1 when we simplify it. Sorry. Which means to be 3x plus 1 here for the final part, your domain will be negative infinity to infinity. Now, I'm technically not going to go over exploration one, but at, at this time, I'd like you to stop your, stop your computer and actually work through the solutions. Put G into F and see what you get for A. So really what you're doing, you're putting column C into column B and seeing what you'll get for F of G. So again, at this time, stop the tape, stop the video, and work on this exploration. Now on example three, we're finding the domain of composition. Again, we're doing pretty much just like we did in example two. So what we need to do here, we need to find f of g of x. which means I'm going to find f of the square root of x, which means I'm going to find the square root of x squared minus 1, which is really going to be x minus 1. However, 
the domain of this function will be zero to infinity. Now we can see that when we graph that. So really what we're going to have, I'm going to put parentheses x, the square root of x squared minus 1. You'll see there, even though x minus 1 will go negative infinity to infinity, our domain, the square root of x squared minus 1, can only go 0 to infinity. Now for g of f of x, We'll have g of x squared minus 1, which will really be the square root of x squared minus 1. Now our domain here, you have to pay attention to. Even though there's no restrictions on x squared minus 1, we know that x squared minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. So when we do this, this means that x squared has to be greater than or equal to 1. Now when we do this, you've got to pay attention. You're going to graph it. So when you graph these, where is it greater than or equal to 0? This is x squared minus 1. Where is it greater than or equal to 0? Well, it's greater than or equal to 0 left of negative 1 and right of positive 1. So our domain, negative infinity and negative 1, in union with 1 to infinity. So there is our domain for that one. Now moving on to b, we're going to do a lot of the same stuff. f of g of x will equal f of the square root of x plus 1, which will really be square root of x plus 1 squared minus 2, which will simplify to x plus 1 minus 2, And again, simplifying to x minus 1. However, our domain, because x plus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0, that means x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. So our domain will be negative 1 to infinity. For g of f of x, we'll have g of x squared minus 2. which would really be x squared minus 2 plus 1, which would really simplify to the square root of x squared minus 1. Funny how we just did this one, but our domain would actually be negative infinity to negative 1, and you name you like 1 to infinity. So again, I'm going to highlight our answers so you can see them. There's our answer to A. There's our answer to B. Now in examples 2 and 3, two functions were composed to form new functions. There are times in calculus when we need to reverse the process. That is, we may begin with a function h and decompose it by finding functions whose composition is h. So what we want to do here, we know h of x equals x plus 1 quantity squared minus 3 times x plus 1 plus 4. Now you should be able to see some things that repeat here. So we know that f of x will equal something, and we know that g of x will equal something. So g of x here, because it looks like we're putting x plus 1 into f of x, we know that g of x is going to be x plus 1. 
f of x will be x squared minus 3x plus 4. And there you have it. Now, generally, there is more than one option for these, as we'll see in B. Now, for part B, it says h of x equals this, the square root of x cubed plus 1. So one option for f would be the square root of x. That means g of x would be x cubed plus 1. Because what we're doing, we're putting x cubed plus 1 into the square of x, square of x. Now, the other option would be, what if we did this? This will work too. And again, the green goes to the green, the red goes to the red. It should be nice and easy. When we get to your homework, if you should have questions, you need to ask very well, and I'll try and walk you through it. Those questions would be 24, 26, 28, and 30 on your homework. Now, like we did in part B, there's often more than one way to decompose a function. For example, an alternative way to, dis to decompose h of x equals x squared of x cubed plus 1 in example 4b is left, like we did, left with f of x equals squared of x plus 1 and g of x equals x cubed. So you get the same thing. Now, we're going to do some real life examples here for example 5. Now, in the medical procedure known as an angioplasty, doctors insert a catheter into a heart vein through a large peripheral vein and inflate a small spherical balloon on the tip of the catheter. Suppose the balloon is inflated at a constant rate of 44 cubic millimeters per second. So we're going to find the volume after t seconds. So my volume will be 44 cubic millimeters times t. Now for part B, when the volume is V, what is the radius R? So what we're doing here, we know the volume of a sphere, well you might not know this, but it's in the back covers of your book, or on the side wall in the classroom, you'll see a poster, we'll have 4 thirds pi R cubed. Now to solve for R, first things first, we need to multiply by 3 divided by 4 pi. So really, We'll get this. Now that means then that r will equal the cube root of 3v over 4 pi. This is the answer that we're looking for. r equals the cube root of 3v over 4 pi. Now for part c, it says write an equation that gives the radius r as a function of the time. What is the radius after 5 seconds? Well, we know our volume is 44t from our first equation. So really what we're doing, we're composing these two functions. We're going to put the 44t in for v to solve for r. So my r will equal the cube root of 3 times 44t over 4 pi. Now let's do some simplifying here to make the calculation a little bit easier. The 44 turns into an 11, the 4 turns into a 1, so really I'll have 33t over pi. But I want to figure out after 5 seconds. So really I'm going to turn the t into a 5 and put that as pi. So that means my radius will be the cube root of 33 times 5 divided by pi. So I'm going to go into my math button, go down to number 4. I'll have 33 times 5. Divide that by pi. And you get your answer of 3.74 millimeters. So your radius at this time, about 3.74 millimeters. And there you have it. So really you just have to go through and work through each of the problems, each part of the problem, and figure out what you need. Now part B. A high altitude spherical weather balloon expands as it rises due to the drop in atmospheric pressure. 
suppose that the radius R increases at a rate of 0 0.03 inches per second, and that R equals 48 inches at time zero. Determine an equation that models the volume of the balloon at time t and find the volume when t equals 300 seconds. Well, because we know, it says here that R will start at 48 inches and it increases 0 0.03 inches at every t second. Now we also know our volume equation. Here's we're going to have. Now, what we want to do, we want to put the 48 plus 0.03t into the volume equation. And the t, we're going to turn into 300 seconds. So this will get our volume at 300 seconds. Now we can put that right into our calculator. So 4 thirds times pi times 48, actually I'm going to get rid of this time symbol. I got to rework that calculations. I forgot to cube my answer here. So again, four thirds pi times 48 plus 0 0.03 times 300 cubed. Let's try that again because that's not quite right either. Let's try this first. Multiply that by pi. Multiply that by four thirds. There's an the answer I can live with. Seven hundred seventy-five thousand seven hundred thirty-four. So again, make sure when you're doing these to put it in your calculator correctly so you get the right answer.